I'm going to present um, uh, today um, the guidelines for the diagnosis and management of chronic coronary syndrome, the ASC guidelines. So I have nothing to disclose. Next slide. Okay, so what is the, um, the new uh, revised concept of um, chronic coronary syndrome? Uh, next slide, uh, please. Uh, so as we all know that um, the uh, clinical presentation of coronary artery disease is uh, categorized to either acute coronary syndrome and, uh, or chronic coronary syndrome. And the guideline has been revised uh, in 2019 uh, to focus on chronic coronary syndrome on, instead of stable coronary artery disease or uh, the previously known uh, chronic stable angina. Next slide. So, yeah, this is the, uh, the one. Okay. So, uh, why is the change? Uh, what is the rationale and what, why is the concept of uh, chronic coronary syndrome? Uh, the change uh, in the name uh, is due to the fact that uh, actually chronic coronary syndrome is not a stable status, not a stable condition. Uh, it encompasses like a wide range uh, or spectrum of uh, presentation. Uh, the patient might pass from a stage of subclinical phase to uh, a, a phase when they develop um, an event, uh, acute coronary syndrome, and then following that event, they are either stabilized for a long period of time or they uh, regress uh, and regress or progress further to uh, another status of uh, worsening of the disease or even an event and then uh, a stabilization of the disease. And as we can see here in this slide, that uh, clearly explain um, the, uh, as we can see in the vertical line, uh, this is the cardiac uh, risk uh, in the form of death of MI um, against the time. And as you can see, um, in all the three uh, or the, the different or various uh, phases of this uh, disease, we can see that uh, the risk uh, of getting death or uh, cardiac um, or myocardial uh, infarction will increase with high risk patients, uh, those who have insufficient uh, optimization of uh, their revascularization or insufficient optimization of risk factors or medication. And uh, the risk goes lower here when we have uh, less, uh, better optimization actually, less uh, risk factors and uh, full revascularization. Uh, next slide. Next slides, please. Um, I'm nodding. Okay. So uh, as we can see here, uh, next, if you click next as well. Uh, so the coronary artery disease is a dynamic process. The chronic coronary artery disease is a dynamic process of atherosclerotic plaque uh, accumulation. And uh, the plaque actually is not stable. Uh, it, you know, a lot can happen due to the plaque, uh, as I explained earlier. And um, the uh, main, uh, actually, uh, aim um, in the management of this disease is uh, to control the um, progression of the disease uh, by the main broad uh, strategies, uh, which is lifestyle modification. And there is a big emphasis our, uh, on the lifestyle modification in, the, in, the, in this guideline, because it, has, it's one of the, it is one of the main pillar of management of those patients. Pharmacological therapies, uh, with optimization will play also or usually play a very major role in the management of those patients and of course the revascularization with uh, the aim eventually to uh, stabilize the disease and stop regression of the disease. Next slide. Now uh, the guidelines has come up with um, you know the um, um, the, the, the wide uh, uh, clinical scenarios or clinical presentation of those patients. Next, uh, uh, we have six scenarios usually we uh, encounter uh, in our uh, uh, daily practice, uh, whether in the outpatient clinic when we are assessing those patients 
or uh, even if some patient they get admitted in the ward. So uh, the first clinical scenario is those uh, patients uh, who uh, have suspected coronary artery disease uh, or um, anginal symptoms and or dyspnea. And this is another thing uh, which has been added to the, the, the new uh, guidelines. The, uh, the dyspnea has been added as one of the possible symptoms of coronary artery disease. So this is the first clinical scenario. And the second clinical scenario is a um, patient with new onset heart failure or LV dysfunction, unsuspected coronary artery disease, a patient who had an echocardiogram which showed um, a um, region one motion abnormality, those patients might uh, be referred to uh, evaluation in the outpatient uh, cardiology clinic. And the third uh, scenario, an asymptomatic patient uh, or symptomatic patient with stabilized symptoms uh, less than a year after initial diagnosis or revascularization. So those patients uh, they are uh, the third category that we uh, encounter in uh, the outpatient uh, uh, clinic. Uh, the fourth uh, scenario is the asymptomatic or symptomatic patient uh, on, uh, after an initial diagnosis of revascularization uh, presenting to you more than one year after, uh, after that. And uh, the fifth one, um, next, Abdelazim, um, is uh, the patient with angina and suspected with spastic or microvascular disease. As we know that uh, we now see a lot of patients with uh, uh, what is called microvascular disease. Uh, the sixth scenario is asymptomatic patient in whom the coronary artery disease is detected at screening. Patient who had a cardiac CT and um, showed uh, uh, some coronary artery disease. And now the, this slide shows, uh, you know, um, the, the new, the, the concept still we are in the, the, the new major uh, changes uh, that happen in this guideline. Uh, the revision, there is a major revision uh, actually of the pre probability uh, test of coronary artery disease based on uh, age, gender, and the nature of symptoms. There is a, a major change in that where they added uh, a new phrase actually, uh, which is the clinical likelihood of coronary artery disease. And uh, this uh, together is uh, uh, with the pre-probability uh, assessment will uh, guide you to uh, further uh, investigate and manage those patients. And there is also uh, uh, an update of the application of various diagnostic tests uh, as we know, imaging has changed uh, and uh, the uh, utilization of imaging has uh, been increasing and uh, especially cardiac CT. And uh, as we know that uh, functional testing has been used widely now to rule in and to rule out the coronary artery disease. There is also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the emphasis on the life uh, style modification and uh, other preventive actions uh, in the management of those patients to decrease the further cardiovascular event and mortality. Next. Uh, next. Uh, so now, uh, this is uh, the, just what happened, uh, the comparison um, between the pre-existing um, guidelines in 2013 and 2019. And uh, as we can see here, uh, maybe one of the uh, first um, uh, change, uh, let me just go, yeah, that um, uh, this guideline um, shows is with regard to exercise ECG um, um, utilization in the diagnosis of uh, chronic coronary syndrome. Uh, in 2013, uh, the exercise treadmill test was class one. And as we can see here, uh, it's downgrade with regard ruling uh, or rule out coronary artery disease. So now it's class 2B, but it's class one in assessment of uh, exercise tolerance, assessment of symptoms, arrhythmia, blood pressure response. So it's a risk assessment tool uh, rather than 
uh, rule and rule out. We use it uh, as rule and rule out uh, with a recommendation, uh, as I said, to be in case that we have no other uh, um, um, tools to investigate, no other functional testing or cardiac uh, CT. And um, it's also used to evaluate the control of symptoms uh, and ischemia. And as we can see here, uh, the recommendation is to be. Um, just, um, can you go to the next slide, uh, Vladimir? Yeah, so this is what the, the, the guideline recommends. So as I said, class one for uh, risk assessment, uh, to be uh, for uh, as an alternative uh, test to rule in and or to rule out, and uh, it's also to be uh, as I mentioned earlier for uh, assessment of control of symptoms. Uh, the um, next uh, blazing. Um, we know that we should not uh, use a uh, treatment test, of course, uh, when we have um, um, certain uh, condition like a uh, patient with ST pre existing ST uh, changes or a patient on uh, digoxin. Um, the other change uh, that we could see in this uh, guidelines, 2019 guideline, with regard uh, the uh, long acting uh, nitrate. Now it should be considered. Uh, actually, can you make it bigger, Abdullah? Because it's a little bit. Oh, okay, I can see now. Um, so, with regard to the use of medication, the long-acting nitrate uh, uh, should be considered as a second-line uh, drug, uh, as well as the. Um, uh, of course, if it is, uh, I'll come to that later. Uh, the first line should be beta blocker or calcium channel blocker uh, or uh, in combination. The second line, you should add long acting um, uh, nitrate if the patient is poorly controlled or intolerant to uh, either beta blocker or calcium channel blocker. Uh, the other um, um, change in the guideline also the other antianginal treatment, uh, including the nicorandal, ranalazine, evabridine, or trimetazidine. Uh, those medication uh, now as uh, class 2A, uh, they should be considered as second line drugs after uh, optimization of the first line drugs on addition of long acting uh, nitrates. And um, the other um, 2B, as we can see, 2B recommendation, uh, in some selected patient, we can use the combination of beta blocker or calcium ch channel blocker with a second line uh, drug, uh, like, uh, uh, for example, ranulazine, nicorandal, evabridine, or trimetazidine. Uh, those, those medications could be also added uh, as first, with the first line medication in some selected patient, and this is class 2B. And this is uh, obviously a change from the previous uh, guideline in 2013. Uh, next slide, Abnazim. Uh, uh, the other um, uh, change in the recommendation uh, or the new update in the recommendation is with regard to microvascular angina or the microvascular uh, disease. In 2019, as we can see here, uh, there is, uh, as we know uh, now, uh, there are, there are uh, the, the microvascular angina actually is um, recognize uh, more and more uh, if we compare uh, you know the, the the with previous or in the previous days now now we can see more patients with microvascular angina like patient presenting with chest pain uh, they have a coronary angiography uh, the it's normal uh, or uh, non significant disease to explain their symptoms patient a diabetic patient or even patient who had revascularization they come back with chest pain those patients uh, could uh, be uh, um, a, a group of patients uh, uh, fall uh, under uh, the um, category of microvascular uh, angina. Uh, and as we can see here in uh, 2019 uh, guideline, uh, the recommendation with regard their, uh, the investigation of those, uh, those patients, and, they, and these are uh, mainly, uh, they mainly fall in the broad category, which is the 
uh, invasive and non-invasive. And as you can see, if we go to the next slide, I'll uh, Next. Next. Yeah, okay. So uh, now it's class 2A uh, for those patients uh, to, um, uh, to proceed uh, and investigate them invasively. And, uh, and this is, uh, of course, involved the uh, cardiac catheterization with the use of uh, guide wire uh, to assess the coronary flow reserve uh, or the microcirculatory uh, resistance uh, through special measurements done in the lab. And those patients, if we suspect that they have this condition, they should be assessed uh, in the lab uh, with those measures. Uh, to, in, in order to diagnose them. Um, and uh, if we go to the next, uh, uh, class 2B, you can assess those patients uh, in the lab also with intracoronary acetylcholine with ECG monitoring. And, um, uh, and of course, uh, uh, those patients, they have to um, get proper assessment uh, with the uh, with these tools uh, in order to further diagnose them. And next, uh, uh, the other um, category of uh, assessment of those patients, the non-invasive, which is mainly the cardiac MR and the PET scan. And as we know that in many patients, uh, they have normal coronary, and then they uh, when they get a cardiac MR, uh, the cardiac MR shows uh, uh, myocardial uh, perfusion defect, which uh, usually explained by microcirculatory uh, dysfunction. Next, Tablazin. So this is one of the, uh, um, the changes in the um, guidelines. Uh, um, now, uh, next, Tablazin. So uh, class one uh, uh, with uh, evidence of C, for those patients, it is required uh, that, of course, ECG is recommended. And um, invasive coronary angiography uh, or coronary uh, CT angiography is recommended for those patients uh, if we're suspecting that uh, or they're presenting with episodic cresting angina and ST segment changes. And uh, if there's evidence that this, there's these symptoms resolve with nitrates or with calcium channel blockers. And uh, next. Uh, the uh, recommendation from the guideline as class 2A that those patients, you can also assess them uh, with ambulatory uh, ECG uh, to assess or evaluate the ST segment uh, or to identify the ST segment uh, deviation in the absence of uh, increased heart rate. So this is one of the recommendations of the guideline for those patients. And uh, next, Ablazim. Uh, and uh, class 2A as well for this patient, uh, as I said, the intracoronary provocative test uh, should be uh, considered for those patients. Um, next, Tablazin. Right, next. Next. Now, um, the, uh, what is the, the new major uh, recommendation uh, with regard to the basic testing and diagnostic testing uh, for risk assessment? Uh, if you go back, uh, next. Okay, right. Uh, no, no, no. If you go back, sorry. <laughs> if you go back. Okay. So now, class one, uh, as we can see here, those patients, any patient uh, presenting with suspected coronary artery disease, uh, with symptoms of angina or uh, uh, even dyspnea, uh, those patients uh, should go for non-invasive functional imaging uh, for myocardial ischemia or coronary uh, CT angiography. So this is class one recommendation. So uh, specifically for those who present for the first time, and uh, we will come later, uh, you know, for the choice of different uh, tools or different tests for those patients. So class one uh, non-invasive functional imaging uh, with cardiac, uh, stress cardiac MR or stress echo or 
uh, even PET scan or myocardial perfusion scan, or cardiac uh, CT coronary angiography, which is uh, almost considered as a separate uh, entity because it's mainly an anatomical test. So we have uh, now, uh, obviously, uh, you know, anatomical and uh, functional tests, and we have the ability to assess those patients uh, with functional tests invasively and non-invasively. Uh, it is recommended that uh, the selection of the initial and invasive test to be based on the likelihood of the coronary artery disease and the patient characteristics and also the local expertise and the availability of the test. So this is obviously class one. So when you choose the test, you have to decide which uh, uh, test uh, according to the availability uh, in your center and according, if you go back to uh, Abdelazim. Yeah. Um, if I go to the, uh, no, sorry, go back. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to say, if we go to the recommendation of the uh, guidelines uh, as 2A, um, 2A uh, recommendation is the invasive coronary angiography. Uh, if you have the ability of uh, to invasively functionally evaluate those patients, if you have a, an FFR or uh, IFR. Right, okay, uh, next slide. So the uh, guidelines with regard, the recommendation of the guidelines with regard to the antithrombotic therapy uh, with uh, coronary, coronary syndrome and sinus rhythm. Uh, as we know that from the pre-existing uh, guidelines that class one is aspirin and clobidogrel. Uh, and uh, uh, clobidogrel uh, is uh, uh, recommended as class one, uh, class 2B in uh, uh, certain patients, those uh, symptomatic or asymptomatic with either peripheral vascular disease or a history of ischemic stroke or transient ischemic attack. Um, the uh, change in the, or the update in the guideline, uh, the new update is the addition of a second antithrombotic drug to aspirin for long-term secondary prevention. Uh, those, uh, uh, you know, recommendation as class 2A um, recommended for those with high risk of ischemic events. Okay, so now we have a, a class 2A recommendation for patients with high risk of ischemic event. Uh, we are uh, allowed to add uh, uh, the second antithrombotic uh, medication for long-term uh, prevention. Uh, in addition to aspirin or uh, uh, clobidogrel. And uh, as class 2B, uh, we can add uh, a second antithrombotic medication to aspirin in those with moderate risk for uh, ischemic events. So that's uh, the, uh, the new change or the new update uh, for the 2019 guideline from the pre-existing pre 2013. Next, uh, next uh, slide. Yeah, so that's what I mentioned. Next. Uh, with regard the uh, next stabilizing, with regard to the antithrombotic therapy in patient uh, with chronic uh, coronary syndrome and atrial fibrillation, now it's class 1A, and this is the, the, you know, the update in this guideline, that uh, of course the, uh, the uh, NOAC now is recommended in preference uh, to uh, vitamin K antagonist. And uh, the class one indication also uh, is uh, the long-term or anticoagulant therapy or a vitamin K antagonist uh, with the time in therapeutic range more than 70% uh, is recommended in patients with atrial fibrillation and child vasque uh, of two or more in males or, uh, and for females, three or more. So this is as class one. While in uh, as uh, class 2A is uh, the same indication with the Chad Vasque a little bit lower, uh, is Chad Vasque one in males and uh, uh, Chad Vasque uh, in females. I think in practice, we most uh, first we uh, we go with class 2A. Um, uh, next, Adlazim. Um, 
Now, this is a recommendation with regard to antithrombotic therapy in post-PCI patient uh, with AF or another indication for oral anticoagulant. Um, next. Okay, so class one uh, indication is to uh, add aspirin or clobidogrel in pre-procedure. And those patients uh, should be given, uh, if they're going for a procedure, should be given the uh, aspirin and clobidogrel, and of course, with a loading dose, if you are uh, intending to uh, uh, stent those patients. Next. Um, and uh, those patients uh, or the patient with, uh, you know, um, going for a PCI, if they are eligible for oral anticoagulant, it is recommended that they should have full dose as class one. So uh, the class one recommendation, uh, if you have an indication of oral anticoagulant, uh, you should give the full dose. Next. Uh, class 2A, next, yeah, class 2A is to give a, a lower dose uh, of rivaroxaban uh, if you're concerned about bleeding. So instead of 20 milligram, you use 15 milligram. And uh, next, and also for a Davigatran, next, uh, you uh, could use the uh, lower dose if you're concerned uh, uh, about bleeding more than the concern of stent thrombosis. Next. And uh, class 2A uh, uh, recommendation is uh, when, we, uh, when we have a patient who had uh, uncomplicated PCI, uh, it is recommended that, uh, you know, you can uh, stop aspirin uh, in a week uh, and you continue with dual antiplatelet, uh, with dual therapy, uh, which is single antiplatelet and oral anticoagulant, um, which is usually uh, clobidogrel. Uh, if you are, uh, you know, concerned about bleeding uh, with a low risk, uh, when you're not really concerned about the risk of stent thrombosis or the risk of stent thrombosis is low. Um, next, you can uh, uh, use uh, the triple therapy, uh, and this the indication is class 2A, uh, which is aspirin, clobidogrel, and the oral anticoagulant for a month or more. Uh, if the risk of stent thrombosis is, uh, outweighs the, the, the risk of bleeding. If you're concerned more about uh, the um, uh, ischemic event or uh, stent thrombosis, then you are uh, allowed uh, and it's recommended as class 2A, uh, which you, could, uh, you should consider um, uh, to use uh, in that case. So this is the, 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 the class 2A with regard to those um, uh, recommendations. Uh, next. Um, those are the options of dual antithrombotic therapy in combination with aspirin. Uh, as we know that we have the rivaroxaban in a, in a, in a lower dose, um, 2.5 milligram uh, twice a day. Uh, if the patient had uh, an MI for uh, more than a year. So you can continue if you're concerned about or the patient has risk for further event, you can uh, combine uh, aspirin with rivaroxaban 2.5 milligram twice a day or ticagrel 60 milligram uh, twice a day uh, for those who uh, had an event and passed a year from uh, their uh, event. And of course, those patients, usually high-risk patients, diabetic patients, multivessel disease, multi-stenting, uh, chronic kidney disease, those patients are um, a high-risk patient that you uh, might consider addition of the, uh, another uh, antithrombotic agent. Um, uh, clobidogrel, prasugrel in some uh, selected patient, and uh, usually post-PCI, uh, for MI patients uh, who have tolerated dual antiplatelet for a year, and uh, you have to be uh, cautious with patients who are, who are uh, patients who are more than 75 years of age. And um, uh, next, next. Uh, the other uh, update of the uh, guidelines now uh, as class 1A, the concomitant, uh, the recommendation of concomitant use of proton pump inhibitor. So uh, it is recommended as class 1 to uh, start those patients uh, um, 
or on a proton pump inhibitor, uh, especially those receiving aspirin, uh, monotherapy or dual antiplatelet therapy or, uh, or anticoagulant therapy, or they have high risk of a GI bleed. Uh, the other uh, update with this guideline is uh, the class one recommendation with regard to lipid lowering agent. So it is recommended that you have to optimize uh, the statin therapy. So if the patient uh, is able to uh, tolerate the maximum dose and still uh, the goal of uh, the or the target of their lipid is not achieved, uh, then it is recommended as class one to add ezetimibe. So you have to optimize the statin and then add ezetimibe. Uh, and if there is intolerance or uh, a, a insufficient uh, control or uh, you could not reach the target, then you could add the um, uh, P PCSK9 uh, inhibitor. And this is class one recommendation. So, but first you have to optimize uh, the statin and to the maximum uh, tolerated dose. Um, uh, with regard to uh, the update um, of the medication as well, now we have this strong potent uh, anti-diabetic agent that used to uh, prevent uh, cardiovascular uh, events in diabetic patients. And now they are recommended uh, as class one, A, uh, for those patients uh, who are diabetic, and as we know that uh, um, the SGL2, uh, they are uh, sodium glucose co-transport uh, two inhibitors. And, uh, you know, we have um, uh, some medications now available and, uh, to use for those patients. And they could help in the management uh, of or prevention of further cardiovascular event. And also uh, uh, in this, um, for a diabetic patient, we have the glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonist. Uh, those patient, uh, those uh, medications are recommended for diabetic patients as class 1. And uh, now the carotid intimal uh, uh, thickening for cardiovascular risk assessment is not recommended uh, as an update for this uh, guideline. And with regard to the refractory angina, treatment of refractory angina, uh, two, be, two B recommendation for um, the reducer device for coronary sinus constriction uh, for, uh, to uh, help the symptoms or uh, to uh, alleviate the symptoms uh, for those who suffer from debilitating angina or refractory angina for medical therapy. Next. Uh, next, because that says, um, right. So this is just what I've mentioned uh, earlier. Um, uh, next, uh, I just want to uh, uh, remind, this is from the pre-existing um, guidelines anyway, we all know that uh, it's class one recommendation uh, is to add the ACE inhibitor or ARB for patient with heart failure or hypertension or diabetes, next. And uh, beta blocker, we know that is also recommended uh, as class 1A. Uh, in patients with previous STEMI, uh, the long-term oral treatment with beta blockers should be considered as class 2A. So next. So this is from the previous um, uh, guideline. So um, with regard to the anginal uh, or relief or the uh, anti-anginal uh, uh, medication, so what the guideline says. Uh, next for, next, Tom Blasen. So for, uh, so class one recommendation is uh, to uh, treat those patients with short acting nitrates. Uh, and this is for immediate relief of uh, exertional angina. And uh, also it's class one uh, recommendation is beta blocker. And, and as we all know that beta blocker uh, or a calcium channel blocker um, uh, from, actually this is from the previous guideline, that uh, they are recommended as class one uh, to control the heart rate and the symptoms. Next. Uh, next. So uh, this is just the, from the pre-existing actually with emphasis on the, you know, the, the new update. Um, the guideline says uh, if the symptoms of angina are not successfully controlled with beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker, uh, 
the combination of beta blocker with uh, dihydropyridine calcium channel broker should be considered, and this is class 2A. And uh, in, uh, it's also recommended that as class 2A, that an initial first line treatment with the combination from the start um, in, in certain patients. So certain patients, you might need to start them with a combination, with a combination of the dihydropyridine uh, uh, and uh, the uh, beta blocker. Uh, dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker and beta blockers. Okay, and uh, next, next. So long acting, uh, maybe I've mentioned that uh, it's class 2A. Now uh, to add uh, long acting uh, nitrate as a second uh, line treatment. Uh, if uh, the initial therapy with beta blocker and optimization is not uh, controlling the symptoms of the patient, uh, then or the patient uh, is poorly to relate, uh, uh, to rating the uh, medication, then you could add the uh, long-acting nitrate. Uh, next, and this is, as I mentioned, I think I mentioned earlier from the um, previous slides. Um, I'll just mention here, uh, class 2B recommendation for those who have a baseline low heart rate with such logic and uh, low blood pressure, uh, those patients you might uh, add uh, the antianginal, uh, which would not affect the heart rate or the blood pressure, such as uh, ranolazine or trimetazidine. Uh, so, of course, you have to tailor, uh, you know, your management according to the patient circumstances and the patient characteristics. So, you might use those medications in the first line instead of beta blocker, or calcium channel blocker, uh, for uh, some selected patient. And this is a two uh, two B recommendation from the guidelines. Uh, and we know that it's not recommended, uh, nitrate is not recommended in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Right, now, uh, uh, next. So what guidelines say about the, uh, the, you know, the management of patients with angina, dyspnea, and suspected coronary disease? Next. Next, I'm loving. Um, I'll just uh, remind, uh, we might have uh, different um, audiences here, just a reminder for uh, you know, um, uh, those who, uh, you know, um, obviously most cardiologists, all, all the cardiologists, we know what is the definition of angina, but just reminding uh, everyone that uh, when we say this is a typical angina, typical angina should meet certain, a certain uh, criteria, three characteristics. It uh, should be exertional, with a typical description, patient uh, will come to you and, and say that I have a chest heaviness, chest tightness, or uh, discomfort. They have different description. And sometimes patients say, I don't have pain, but I have heaviness. So they don't sometimes describe the heaviness as chest pain. So you have to take a very good history. So restricting discomfort with a typical uh, radiation, exertional relieved by rest and uh, or uh, nitrate within five minutes. So if we have all these three uh, criteria, this is typical angina. Next. If, next, yeah, if we, uh, if we have only two criteria or two characteristics, this is atypical angina. Next. And uh, we could say this is a non-angina chest pain if only one of uh, uh, these three characteristics is present. Okay, so next. And of course, we have to uh, grade those, uh, uh, you know, uh, patient symptoms according to the Canadian Cardiovascular Society. Next. Um, now, uh, the guideline um, provided like a guidance, and this is just uh, maybe update from the previous uh, um, guidelines, 2013 guidelines. And this is uh, the diagnostic approach, uh, stepwise diagnostic approach. Uh, you know, in the management or assessment of those patients. If, if you have a patient presented with angina uh, and or dyspnea, uh, and you're suspecting coronary artery disease, so you have uh, uh, to assess uh, them systematically. So assess symptoms, uh, perform all the clinical investigations uh, with the basic blood test, and rule out the instability or acute coronary syndrome. And if the patient has uh, evidence of acute coronary syndrome, this patient will go to the pathway of uh, the, the ACS guidelines. The next step uh, is uh, to consider the comorbidity and the life uh, quality, the quality of life uh, of those patients. 
uh, so if the quality or the baseline uh, of those patients uh, is poor, then uh, you would think to manage those patients medically because revascularization would be futile. If the patient has a very poor mobility, a lot of comorbidity, then uh, they, in these uh, circumstances, um, they, uh, it would not be for best of, uh, interest of the patient to send them for revascularization for further invasive uh, testing and imaging and uh, uh, procedures. The third step is, of course, uh, you know, the workup with the resting ECG, the all the, the biochemistry, including the full blood count, the, the um, uh, uh, troponin, uh, as I said earlier, we have to rule out the acute uh, coronary syndrome, and the chest X-ray in selected patient, the echocardiogram at rest. And uh, the, th the fourth step, um, the, to assess the pre-probability and the likelihood of the coronary artery disease. Uh, so if you have, uh, you know, uh, if you identify, you know, the, the cause of the chest pain, which is not related to coronary artery disease, then those patients, you can refer them to the appropriate uh, investigation. The fifth step, uh, following the assessment of the, the test probability and the clinical li likelihood, and then you will uh, send those patients for further workup, the diagnostic testing. And then uh, according to the li clinical likelihood and the pre-probability and the patient characteristic, you will choose which tests, uh, which functional tests or anatomical tests or uh, that you, you know, you, you're going to send this patient uh, for. So you might, you know, choose the cardiac CT, for example, for those who have a very low uh, uh, risk or uh, have uh, low probability or clinical likelihood. And uh, of course, um, if the clinical likelihood is more towards uh, the possibility, then you go for the functional testing and even to invasive coronary angiography with uh, preferably uh, invasive functional testing like FFR or IFR. And uh, step six, of course, to choose the appropriate therapy based on the symptoms and the event. Right, so this is the basic, uh, I'm not going to go into details because we all know that it's uh, class 1A is all the basic tests. Here, um, next, uh, uh, I just would like to um, um, mention here that the guideline states that uh, we should not use the ST segment alteration um, as uh, evidence of coronary artery disease for those presenting with a supraventricular arrhythmia. Uh, next. Uh, next. Next. Yeah, uh, here just the, the recommendation of the guidelines, which is 2A recommendation, uh, for uh, those patients who uh, are suspected to have vasospastic angina, uh, it is recommended actually, and uh, it's a 2A as uh, we can see. Uh, you, should, you should consider ambulatory uh, ECG uh, recording uh, to identify the ST uh, shift in, in, in those patients uh, uh, without increasing the heart rate. Next. Uh, this, this slide shows the recommendation for um, um, the echocardiogram uh, in the assessment of patients with coronary uh, syndrome. Uh, next. So when do you do uh, echocardiogram for those patients? So it's class one recommendation for uh, those patients uh, who have, who, you know, whom you want to actually to identify uh, any regional wall motion abnormality. You are, um, you know, suspecting that they have coronary artery disease. So echocardiogram, uh, you know, could identify um, uh, those patients. If you want to exclude other alternative cause of um, chest pain or angina. And uh, of course, it's important to assess the LV uh, ejection fraction and uh, the evaluation of diastolic dysfunction. So this is class one recommendation for those patients. Uh, class two uh, A recommendation is uh, ultrasound of the carotid arteries uh, for those uh, without known atherosclerotic disease. So you uh, uh, should consider uh, this test for those patients. Uh, and uh, cardiac MR uh, could be considered uh, or may be considered actually 
uh, with uh, inconclusive. If we have a, an echocardiogram and still we are, um, um, you know, uh, not um, completely convinced that this patient, uh, you know, um, or we are suspecting that this patient has an underlying um, either coronary artery disease or other uh, cardiac problem. So this is to the recommendation next. Next. So I mentioned that already. Yeah, next. Uh, next. So chest x-ray is called as recommended. Now this is, um, you know, the recommendation of the guideline or this is uh, what the guideline, uh, you know, uh, mentioned to guide us to, the, to assess those patients. So the, this is the, just as how to assess the pre-probability uh, of, uh, of obstructive coronary artery disease uh, uh, in, in those patients. And the new, uh, um, actually, update in this guideline, next, uh, next, I'm is the uh, addition of dyspnea as, uh, you know, uh, as a factor or as, is not only the typical atypical or non-angina uh, chest pain, but now uh, the guidelines and the guidelines in 2019 uh, they have added dyspnea, uh, which could be a symptom of uh, coronary artery disease. So it's very important that we assess those patients for the, the pre-probability um, uh, of the disease. And uh, we know that, that most of the patients who present uh, with uh, chest pain, uh, you know, they don't have angina. So um, the pre-probability -prob test with the likelihood um, uh, you know, uh, guided us more to identify those patients who really need further testing and who really uh, need to be uh, considered for uh, management of uh, chronic, uh, chronic uh, coronary disease. Um, okay, next. So now, in addition to the pre-probability testing, uh, those are other factors that we should, uh, you know, add to, in order to uh, um, identify the high-risk patient uh, or to, uh, you know, to guide us with, with regard the, the, the likely, the clinical likelihood of coronary artery disease. So uh, if we have, for example, the normal, normal exercise ECG, no coronary calcium score by uh, CT, uh, those patients have less likelihood for coronary artery disease. They are low uh, risk for coronary artery disease. Those who have uh, dyslipidemia, diabetes, hypertension, smoking, family history of coronary cardiovascular uh, disease or coronary artery disease, uh, those with ECG changes, uh, resting ECG changes like Q waves or ST segment uh, depression, T, T wave changes, uh, those patients, they, have, they are you know, likely to have an underlying coronary artery disease, and also those with LV dysfunction uh, and abnormal exercise ECG or coronary calcium score uh, of high level or high um, uh, calcium, uh, CT calcium score. Uh, though it's, uh, now it's not the main uh, test um, to uh, provide the likelihood for uh, coronary artery disease. Next. So those parameters uh, would, uh, together with the pre-probability pre test, will guide us uh, to um, the next step, which is choosing which uh, test, which non-invasive test you are going to use or you're going to send this patient for. So coronary cardiac CT, uh, you uh, might wish to consider those uh, with low clinical likelihood, uh, patient, uh, also you should consider the patient characteristic. If the patient characteristic suggests that you will get good quality, a high image quality, then those patients are suitable for cardiac CT. Um, those with a heart rate of less than 60, uh, those of course in sinus rhythm. And if you have the local expertise and the availability, and uh, if the patient uh, does not have a history of coronary artery, those patients are suitable, more suitable for uh, cardiac CT, and also sometimes uh, also the younger patient, uh, you might consider uh, with, a with a low risk or low likelihood for the disease. So you uh, consider cardiac CT for those patients. The non-invasive testing for ischemia, and now it uh, depends on the, uh, the, the likelihood. So the more a high likelihood for coronary artery disease, 
uh, the more you will go towards the assessment of ischemia. So if um, you think that the clinical likelihood is high or you think that this patient might go for revascularization and you have the local expertise and you want to assess also the viability in certain uh, patient, uh, you might uh, choose um, cardiac stress cardiac MR, myocardial perfusion scan or stress echo. So those patients, uh, you, know, um, you know, might be, you know, certain patients uh, with high clinical likelihood might be suitable for those testing. And those, uh, if you go back again, yeah, uh, just uh, the high clinical likelihood, the, 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 the very high like clinical likelihood with severe symptoms uh, and refractory to medical therapy, typical angina with low level of exercise, uh, these features indicate high risk uh, for events and also LV uh, uh, systolic dysfunction. So those patients, you might send them uh, to invasive coronary angiography. So you might consider sending them. So it depends, all depends, your choice of uh, the non-invasive test depends on your assessment of the likelihood of coronary artery disease with the pre probability and the clinical likelihood. So with invasive coronary angiography, if you choose to go for coronary angiography, if you find a, a, a lesion which is 90 and above, you might, you know, go for uh, a head and stand those patients. Uh, or if they, particularly if they have established a correlation of ischemia. If uh, the lesion between 90 to 50, then it is recommended that you should have an invasive functional assessment, FFR, IFR, uh, all this invasive testing is recommended uh, to guide your revascularization. And, uh, uh, and of course, if the patient has less than 50 uh, or moderate disease, uh, usually uh, they could be managed with uh, medical therapy. Next. Next. Uh, this slide just, um, you know, uh, it shows the, you know, the likelihood of, you know, the test uh, you know, the, the clinical likelihood of coronary artery disease and, uh, you know, which test that you could choose uh, and which test we would give you the rule in, rule out. So as we mentioned from the uh, previous slide, the stress ECG is not a test now recommended for rule in, rule out, but the functional testing uh, like stress cardiac MR, stress echo or SPECT or PET and coronary, uh, cardiac CT uh, coronary angiography, and we know that, uh, you know, even uh, there is a tool to assess uh, uh, the functional, um, uh, you know, the FFR by cardiac CT. So those tests are more uh, likely to give you, uh, you know, an answer for the likelihood of, you know, those patients having um, significant coronary artery disease. So if they are positive, uh, so probably those patients have uh, coronary artery disease. Uh, next. Next. Uh, this slide uh, is an important slide just to, um, um, uh, I'll just go, go into details. Uh, now, when you send a patient for an, uh, a stress test, what are you expecting uh, in the report? Uh, in order to identify the high risk patient. And if you are the one who's reporting uh, the test, what you should write and what you should inform your, uh, you know, your colleague, your, uh, the cardiologist who requests the, uh, the, uh, the test. For exercise ECG, and as, we, uh, as I mentioned, it's not class one, but uh, in certain circumstances when we don't have availability, and it is in the guideline as, um, um, uh, you know, as a tool for assessment of those patients. So you expect to uh, see, uh, um, you know, a description of the cardiovascular mortality and the Duke score. If the cardiovascular mortality uh, is uh, more than 3% per year, uh, according to the Duke treadmill score, those patients are, high, are uh, high risk and you might consider sending them for, um, you know, the um, invasive uh, procedure. With regard to SPECT or PET perfusion imaging, uh, you have to get the uh, get information, or to, you have to report information about the percentage of the area of ischemia. So, ten or more area of ischemia of the left ventricle uh, myocardium. This is significant, and those patients might need further, um, you know, workup. 
with regard to stress echo, three or more segments of the 16 segments uh, showing stress inducible hypokinesia or akinesia. Uh, this is a significant um, uh, uh, finding, and those patients uh, would be considered for uh, further um, uh, or sending them to coronary angiography. Cardiac MR. If you have two or more of, uh, uh, of the 16 segments of stress perfusion defect, uh, then this is significant. Or if you're using dobutamine, then three uh, or more of uh, dobutamine induced dysfunction segment uh, is considered as significant. For coronary, coronary cardiac CT or um, coronary, uh, coronary cardiac CT and geography, Three vessel, if you find three vessel disease uh, with proximal stenosis or a left main disease or proximal anterior descending disease, those patients are high risk and then they should be uh, referred or uh, uh, sent for um, consideration of invasive coronary angiography and probable revascularization. Uh, for the invasive uh, functional testing, if you're, or if you're uh, interventional in the lab, uh, so what is a significant uh, figure for FFR? It's uh, 0.8 or less. And uh, I, uh, WFR or IFR is uh, 0.89 or less. So these are important um, uh, for, you know, uh, identifying the high-risk patients when we, um, you know, send a special for these so invasive testing or even uh, functional testing with uh, invasive angiography. Next. Um, this is, uh, you know, just maybe almost a summary of uh, what I've mentioned. Uh, this is just the risk assessment from the pre-existing guideline, and I've already mentioned that. Uh, what else in the guideline? The, the, in the guideline, there is a, a, a quiet emphasis on the lifestyle recommendation, the lifestyle modification. Uh, it's one of the main pillar of uh, the management of those patients. And this includes a smoking cessation, healthy diet, physical activity, uh, healthy weight, um, or the, you know, the, the, the other um, uh, you know, uh, lifestyle if, you know, the, with regard the, um, you, those patients should have advice with regard to sexual activity um, uh, and uh, also the use of some uh, the, the uh, medication uh, like Viagra with uh, nitrates and all these, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, advice should be given to those patients uh, or phosphodiesterase inhibitors. So next, so lifestyle modification uh, is a main, uh, one of the main uh, factors uh, or the, in the management, one of the main um, uh, important uh, steps in the management of those patients. Healthy diet as well, I'm not going to go into details of this uh, slide, but healthy diet is recommended. Uh, this is just the, you know, it's all class 1A, as we can see, the lifestyle management, including the cognitive behavior. If you go back, um, yeah, cognitive behavior, uh, um, you know, intervention in some selected uh, patient or even for all patients, uh, the uh, uh, cardiac based, uh, exercise based cardiac rehabilitation is very important. Uh, the involvement of the multidisciplinary. Uh, healthcare professionals, uh, which include the cardiologists, GPs, nurses, dietitian, uh, psychologists as well, uh, psychotherapy uh, might be uh, important in those specifically or particularly for those who have in uh, refractory angina uh, to help them in, in the management of the, uh, you know, the angina pain. Uh, there's also class one indication for annual influenza vaccine for patients with chronic coronary syndrome, especially in elderly. Uh, patients. Next. Next. Uh, this is just, you know, um, uh, mentioned uh, earlier, probably the, you know, just uh, like a step uh, wise and how to, uh, you know, to, to, to treat those patients uh, and use the uh, medication, uh, you know, the stepwise management for this patient. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quite um, helpful, uh, I think, helpful um, um, uh, approach. Uh, I'm not going to go into details, but it's very clear uh, the standard therapy and when to use, uh, you know, the beta blocker, you know, and calcium channel blocker. If you have a high heart rate, when you have a, a low heart rate, which medication you should choose. And in patients with LV dysfunction, beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, 
uh, they are, uh, you know, the mainstay of the treatment. And uh, when you have a low blood pressure or hypertensive patient, you have to, you know, uh, tailor your management according to that. And, you know, you have to choose alternative like Ivabridine, Lanalazine. Um, so next, so this is just um, uh, uh, helpful guidance. Um, general consideration, I think I probably mentioned that. The only thing that I would, uh, if you go back, uh, Abulaz, you know, just mentioned that, you know, it's class one uh, recommendation that you should um, uh, review the response of medical therapy. If you start patient with medication, you have to review the response of those uh, uh, medicate the response of the patient to the uh, treatment within two to four weeks. Uh, so this is class one recommendation. Uh, so uh, it's very important to follow uh, up those patients to assess their response. If you need, if they need up titration, if they are not tolerant, you can choose another medication uh, in certain circumstances. Uh, next. And uh, I think uh, this is uh, antithrombotic. This slide, this is the, the recommendation for the antithrombotic therapy post PCI in patients with chronic coronary syndrome and sinus rhythm. Uh, so we know that the pre-existing uh, guidelines, the aspirin clobidogrel is recommended uh, following stenting. And this is class one, uh, usually for uh, six months, uh, irrespective for uh, coronary for the type of the stent, uh, unless you are concerned with bleeding, and then and this could be shortened to uh, about one to three months. So the class one is a combination of dual antibiotic therapy, aspirin clobidogrel for patients with uh, coronary, uh, chronic coronary syndrome uh, who had a PCI. And this is up to six months, and you can uh, reduce that duration to one or to between one to three months according to the risk of bleeding. So this is class one. And class 2A, um, uh, those, um, you know, the clobidogrel is recommended, uh, of course, following the uh, loading dose. Uh, or if they have, if they have, the patient had a maintenance dose for more than five days, this is also equivalent to the loading dose of 600 milligram. So you should consider uh, clobidogrel uh, for um, uh, three months in patients with high risk of life-threatening bleeding. This is 2A, okay? And um, 2B, uh, you should consider, 2B, you may consider clobidogrel uh, for though for about one month with very high risk of uh, you know or life threatening bleeding, okay. So uh, that's to um, uh, be the other to be recommendation, which uh, something that you may uh, consider is prasugrel or ticagrel. So you may uh, consider those uh, as initial therapy uh, in specific high risk situation of elective stenting. Uh, for example, if you have a suboptimal stent uh, deployment, or if you have uh, other procedure, a difficult procedure, or um, you know some technical uh, you know uh, complication with the procedure, uh, or when when uh, where there's a very high risk of stent thrombosis, uh, complex left main or multi vessel stenting, and those patients you might consider uh, high, you know more uh, stronger. Um, antibiotic therapy such as prasugrel or ticagrel as initial therapy. Uh, or sometimes in some circumstances if the patient uh, cannot tolerate um, aspirin as well. So you, uh, you know, guidelines uh, recommend uh, those medication as uh, 2B uh, with a level of evidence C. Next. Um, this is just, uh, I think, uh, probably just summary of what I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is just a recommendation, the guideline recommendation, which is almost the pre-existing, and I've mentioned most of them, in patients with uh, LV uh, impairment. Uh, we know that in addition to beta blocker, it's inhibitor, uh, which is class one, uh, diuretic is recommended uh, if the patient uh, have uh, signs and symptoms of pulmonary congestion or peripheral congestion. 
um, then you know diuretics which could be adjusted according to the clinical status and uh, ARB is recommended as an alternative in patients who do not tolerate ACE inhibitor as we know and uh, uh, the other recommendation uh, from uh, the guideline that I would like to emphasize, uh, class 2A, uh, the evabridine as, uh, you know, it should be considered uh, as class 2A uh, recommendation in patients with sinus rhythm with uh, LV ejection fraction of 35 or less and a resting heart rate of more than 70. So this is a pre-existing, uh, you know, uh, guidelines just want to remind uh, uh, you know, the audience. Uh, this is, again, this is not uh, um, uh, an update, but this is the guideline, the pre-existing adipose device and comorbidity. We do not need to uh, go into detail. This is just the guidance, uh, again, a slide from the, uh, uh, the uh, ESC guidelines, um, guidance with regard, uh, you know, the follow-up of those patients. So the green, um, uh, color is advisable and the gray one is optional uh, with the, uh, the, the yellow is um, uh, the time for decision making for dolantiplatelet uh, in PCI patient and the, um, the red color is the time uh, for the decision making uh, with regard option, optional uh, you know, antithrombotic, dual antithrombotic therapy. So this is a, a guidance actually from the uh, uh, ESC uh, guidelines, which, uh, you know, you might choose to um, uh, look at uh, in order to help uh, yourself to, in the management of those patients. Uh, this is again, uh, just guidance for the, you know, I mentioned that earlier, uh, when to use the echocardiogram and uh, the ischemic testing. Again, this is just, um, uh, I mentioned most of those uh, actually in the previous uh, guidelines. Um, there's nothing new. Again, guidelines mentioned, uh, you know, the, um, the, this is just like to show the definition of the, uh, you know, the threshold for uh, the definition of hypertension uh, with different type, uh, blood, uh, types of blood pressure uh, measurement. Uh, we don't need to go into details for that. Uh, here, the recommendation, of course, of the guideline, this is pre-existing as well. And as we know that class 1A, uh, we need to control, you know, the class 1A recommendation from the guideline to, uh, is um, uh, the good control of blood pressure, which is one of the risk factors of coronary artery disease. Um, okay, and uh, next slide. Um, next. Um, I'm not going to go into details. Um, uh, next. I think I covered all this. This is just uh, all slides guidance uh, from the, you know, the um, ESC guidelines, what to do or what not to do, uh, you know, uh, in assessing those patients. I've already mentioned all this. This is just uh, you know, um, the last uh, slide from my talk, just to show you one of uh, the patient who presented actually to stress echo. Uh, he came with symptoms uh, as an outpatient actually, uh, for uh, with symptoms of chest pain. Uh, he had a stress echocardiogram. Um, this is a stress, this is a four chamber views. Uh, this is rest, stress, peak stress, and this is another, you know, few minutes uh, post-stress. This is exercise uh, treadmill test. This is not uh, a dobutamine stress test. So this patient, uh, as we can see that all uh, the uh, walls are contracting at rest. This is the antiseptal wall. Maybe it's not very clear, but if we could see here in the actually post-exercise or the peak uh, exercise with a heart rate of 159, the anterolateral wall uh, is almost echinotic and, you know, it's, you know, worse than, um, you know, a few minutes post exercise. And this is a two chamber view. Um, uh, I don't know if you, uh, Abdel Azim, can you, can you show the two, the second image to the left, to the right, sorry, to the right. Yeah. Uh, if you go back, Abdel Azim. 
if you go back to the previous slide. So uh, the, uh, the image to the uh, right side, to the right side, this, the, the second image is not, uh, if you click on the play, yeah. Okay, so this is this, the, the two chamber view. As we can see here, the interior wall is almost akinetic and the, you know, if you could see the heart rate 155. So at rest, it was 91, it was contracting. 155, the, the interior. With that, I come to an end for my presentation. I hope that has been um, useful. It's, it's you, a lot of information. You. And, um, and uh, maybe Abdelazim for the next talk uh, will give us more uh, think, uh, explanation. Uh, the, the wall is started to be almost echinotic and here uh, you can see the anterior wall is almost not, not um, uh, moving. So next slide of Lazen. And uh, this is the three chamber view here on the left hand side. Uh, again, we can see the anteroceptal uh, at rest was contracting and uh, with a heart rate of 150 is started to you know almost to be echinotic if you could see in the third image on the right hand side this is the long parasternal uh, you could see the interoceptal here is almost you know echinotic in the exercise so this patient this is an example of a patient who had a stress test which was in that case stress echo this is a short axis uh, view uh, this patient was strongly positive with ECG changes uh, during the exercise stress test, and he was referred for urgent uh, surgery. He underwent the three vessel disease graft. I don't have details for that, but he was referred uh, urgently for the tertiary center, and he had uh, triple bypass surgery. Uh, with that, I come to an end for my presentation. I hope that has been um, useful. It's, it's a lot of information, and... Um, and uh, maybe Abdelazim for the next talk uh, will give us more uh, think, uh, explanation. Uh, with, uh, thank with you. The